Good morning. This has been Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Lizzie Burden in London, and these are the stories that set your agenda. Shares in Hong Kong rally while Treasury yields come off their 2024 highs as traders count down to the latest reading on U.S. inflation. The Fed's Raphael Bostic says he sees just one U.S. rate cut this year, but adds he's open to altering his view if the economic picture changes. Plus, Apple says it made $14 billion worth of iPhones in India last fiscal year, doubling production as the tech giant accelerates its pivot away from China. Well, good morning. And it's caution in the markets this morning as we await that inflation print later. Traders impatient for rate cuts have already had to contend with two hot CPI reports this year. Will the third be another thorn in their side? Now, as stocks were waiting for this report yesterday, you did have the S&P 500 dipping below that 5,200 level. NVIDIA leading the losses, closing just above it. And this morning, future stateside pointing to a higher opening as they are here in Europe. But if we flip the board over to the cross-asset picture, we're not expecting too much movement on Treasuries in as we wait for the CPI report, she says, triggering fireworks in the markets. But you did have Treasuries climbing in yesterday's session, the 10-year yield falling well below that 4.5% level. 4.35% is where we are currently. The dollar pretty steady, Brent back Uh, below $90 a barrel, holding the two-day decline because, on the one hand, you had this industry report pointing to a gain in U.S. crude stockpiles, but on the other, you've got geopolitical tensions in the Middle East capping the losses. And then just finally, gold. The level that we're looking for for the intraday record high is 2384, and we're hovering just below that currently. But let's get a look at broader Asia markets now. Tanya Chen's waiting for us in Hong Kong. Tanya, what's happening where you are? Hey, good morning, Lizzie. Um, So just breaking in the last hour, we did see that Fitch Ratings has just cut the outlook for China down to negative from stable. Um, Just want to give you a couple details here. They're citing long-term foreign problems, increasing risk to its fiscal buffers. Um, The agency did affirm its A-plus default rating, given obviously still solid economic growth prospects and obviously their strength in trade. Um, And just wanted to uh, tell you also about the response that we've gotten from the Chinese ministry Um, They responded saying they were disappointed about Fitch's outlook revision and that it will continue to resolve its local government debt problems and that the scale of the local hidden debt has been reduced gradually. And if you take a look at Chinese equities, they've just reopened after this lunch break. Prior to the lunch break, they were outperforming, especially the tech shares are really leading that. It seems like they're actually holding on to those gains. Um, Also elsewhere in China assets, you know, the bond yield, it really didn't react much earlier when the news had come out. Same with the yuan. Um, That might be because the sentiment has been already maybe priced into the market. In December, we saw Moody's had actually done the same revision, uh, cutting its outlook to negative. That was then um, on similar uh, concerns around the fiscal picture, but also the spiraling uh, property downturn as well. Um, And also just elsewhere in benchmarks, um, equity benchmarks across Asia, um, it's a quite light trading day, as you were saying, ahead of CPI. Um, Also a couple of holidays in Asia as well. Uh, Most of the kind of attention right now is kind of on the Forex market. Um, if you flip to uh, the yen board there, um, the yen is still just right below that 34 year low against the dollar. Uh, earlier today, Bloomberg had reported that there's uh, considerations that the central bank may uh, raise its inflation forecast later this month. Um, obviously, traders are really waiting to see if the uh, J- Japanese government will come in and intervene, especially right below that 152 level. Um, and also elsewhere in New Zealand, they had a hawkish hold today, um, concerns around obviously the inflation picture. But they're also looking potentially for a more sustained uh, period of restrictive policy. So you're seeing the Kiwi also slightly higher. I put on the board uh, Thai bot and also Taiwan dollar there, uh, Central Bank of Thailand, coming out with a monetary policy decision today. All right, Tanya Chen in Hong Kong, we thank you. As we note that markets are closed in Singapore and South Korea, plenty more happening nonetheless. But let's get back to the U.S. macro story because Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic says he's open to changing his view from seeing one rate cut this year to more or later cuts if the economic picture changes. This is ahead, of course, of the U.S. inflation reading that we're expecting later today. And for analysis, Bloomberg's Jill Desis joins us now. Jill, what sort of CPI print do you reckon could really move market bets on Fed cuts? Which numbers are you focused on? 
Well, Lizzie, I think what you really want to see in the CPI print is more of a moderation in some of those core uh, services prices. So particularly when you're looking at um, like owner equivalent rents, um, primary rents, you want to see something that actually does indicate uh, that there's more of a, dis a disinflationary trend there. Um, I think that that would probably help move the needle at least a little bit because I think the overall numbers, I mean, the headline CPI gauge, you're looking at the core CPI gauge um, might be a bit cooler. I uh, don't know that we're we're going to expect something as hot as January and February, particularly because a lot of the hotness around those numbers was attributed to more seasonal factors. But yeah, I think that when you're combining, um, you know, in any case, when you're combining some of this inflation data with what we've already seen, um, you know, out of this really resilient labor market, uh, you know, those non-farm payrolls that we just got, um, it's it's really just about how much progress can we actually make toward disinflation to get, um, you know, the Fed back in line with that 2% annual target. Uh, We'll see what we end up getting out of this March one. I think it'll be a little bit more difficult to explain away things as seasonal, uh, but we'll ultimately see once we gear up for those CPI data later this, uh, this, this today. Okay, and the other highlight on the agenda today is, of course, the Fed minutes out at 7 p.m. London time. Given all the data surprises we've had since the last FOMC meeting, how useful, Jill, would these minutes actually be? Well, Lizzie, I mean, look, I think that anything is useful uh, when it comes to the Fed to some extent. I think that, you know, you'll see something in there that at least, uh, you know, kind of tells us about why some of those FOMC members started to pare back uh, their bets on rate cuts. We obviously didn't see um, a massive shift in the dot plot, but we did see a little bit of a pare back, at least, um, you know, during the last meeting. So maybe we'll get a little bit more clarity there. Um, you know, maybe we'll uh, get some more details on some of those, um, you know, supply side economic concerns. Concerns. And ultimately, I think, um, you know, you might get some more uh, flavor in there about why it is that the Fed really sees this as kind of this Goldilocks economy right now, as Bloomberg Economics has been saying. It's not too hot, not too cold. But what do you do with that when, you know, we're trying to gear up for um, when exactly you're expecting those first interest rate uh, decisions to come? But yes, I think that it's been a little bit noisy, um, particularly when we've gotten, you know, that uh, that labor market data. Um, you know, we're also just, you know, confronting this uh, the CPI data that's coming up. Um, so as, um, you know, I mean, as long as they keep saying that we're really, really data dependent, yeah, I mean, those, those minutes um, seem to feel like they're getting a bit more out of date uh, just because every single time you get that, it's like, well, we've had like, you know, several, several data prints in the, the lineup. So we'll see, though, um, hopefully we get a little bit more strategy uh, thinking on, um, you know, again, why, why they were at least starting to think about pairing back those, those rates at that time. We'll take any clues at this point on the path ahead for Fed cuts. Bloomberg's Jill Desis, thank you for that analysis. Now, Bloomberg has learned that Apple has assembled $14 billion of iPhones in India over the past fiscal year. So, in effect, they've doubled production as it accelerates to push the, accelerates the push to diversify beyond China. For more on this Bloomberg scoop, let's bring in our India technology correspondent, Sankalp Pritayal. Uh, Fertial. Um, Sankalp, Sankalp uh, how much is this demand driven how much is this supply increase driven by Indian demand for iPhones? <laughs> The Indian demand is still small. Uh, in shipment terms, Apple's about 6% of uh, India's market. So the iPhones are still pricey in India. There are no uh, carrier plans in India. So much of this, this demand is actually export demand. Apple uh, exports a bulk of its devices that it makes in India. And Sankal, what does it show about the significance more broadly of India to Apple? So what we reported was that Apple made $14 billion worth of uh, iPhones in India. These are factory gate pri uh, prices. What this shows is this shows the rise of India as a manufacturing hub. It also shows that Apple is tying its fate to India in, in some ways where it's trying to diversify out of China, where uh, you know Washington and Beijing are constantly in a tussle, a trade war. So Apple's like putting its uh, eggs in different baskets and it's using India as a major destination to make iPhones. With this, Apple is making about 15% of its global I, uh, iPhone output in India in, in volume terms. So this is incredibly important for Apple as well. And where does it leave Apple's relationship with China? What's China going to be thinking as they look on at this increase in production in India? 
I'm, I'm pretty sure they're not going to be happy. But uh, what I can say is uh, our reporting shows that Apple's done this shift very steadily, but very quietly. They don't make noises about it. Uh, uh, they'd like to do things very quietly in general, but uh, all of their three major contract manufacturers, the Taiwanese, have steadily increased uh, the number of workers at their factories, manufacturing lines. In fact, now there's an Indian iPhone maker, the Tata Group, and they're building uh, their own factory, which we've uh, reported previously. So uh, I think there is some manufacturing coming India's way from China, but the overall uh, you know, environment in India is good for Apple, and therefore I think they're, they're betting on this market, both in terms of manufacturing and in terms of sales as well. All right, our India technology correspondent, Suncult Fertial, we thank you. Excellent reporting. A Bloomberg scoop right there. Now, we have got a busy day ahead. At 6.30 a.m. London time, we get TSMC monthly sales. Of course, this is the world's top chip maker. Its shares already saw their biggest gain in more than a month yesterday on the news that it's set to win grants and loans from the U.S. government. And we're going to bring you full analysis of those numbers from Tim Culpin out of Taipei later this hour but before uh, and then we'll get to the big highlight of the day at 1 30 p.m london time and this is of course the u.s inflation report as we've been discussing with jill desis the numbers for march the expectation being for a tick down to 0.3 percent at the headline and core levels but of course chair powell's really hammered home recently that there'll be no cuts until officials are sure inflation's on track to that two percent target so we'll watch out for more bumps in the road of disinflation. And then at 7 p.m. London time, we'll get the Fed minutes for the March meeting. The explanation behind the shift in the dot plot toward fewer cuts for 2024. But as Jill says, we've had lots of economic data surprises since then. Still, we'll take whatever clues we can get. But you can get a roundup of the stories you need to know to get your day going by going to the edition of Daybreak today. Just go to DAYB Go on your terminal. You've got a bit of China news there uh, to kick off your day. But coming up on Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, how are relations between the European Union and South Africa? We're going to discuss that after the failure to host a bilateral summit last year. Is South Africa turning elsewhere in the world for allies? That's next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Now to a curious dynamic in international relations. South Africa and the European Union say they are working on plans for a bilateral summit. But it comes after Bloomberg reported plans to hold a gathering last year had been thwarted, with South Africa failing to commit to a date. For more on what's happening behind the scenes, joining me now is Bloomberg's Jennifer Zabasaja. Jen, what's behind the current concerns here? Yeah, Lizzie, I mean, the concerns, as you mentioned, uh, really center around this trade relationship between South Africa and the European Union, something that both sides really call it strategic. Uh, but the reason why there is concern is the European Union is South Africa's biggest trade partner, uh, biggest foreign investor. In 2022, it actually accounted for $56.4 billion in commerce. But then the big question is, why haven't we seen these summits happen? And these summits really, uh, you know, started uh, based on this agreement between the two blocks. Uh, in, 20, in 2004, it's called the Trade Development and Cooperation Agreement. And as part of that agreement, it was meant to have annual, uh, regular political dialogues. And that's what we saw from the summits that were held between 2009 and 2013. Uh, but the big question, as you mentioned in your intro, is why then haven't we seen uh, summits happen since then? We heard uh, people familiar with the matter speak to our Bloomberg's Anthony Squazine, uh, saying that the reason why we didn't see it last year is that that potentially uh, South Africa was just not committing to a, a date. Uh, and that really is a concern, especially if we think about what we saw in 2023 here in South Africa. We saw the country holding uh, Navy exercises with Russia and with China, uh, of course, also being uh, accused by a U.S. ambassador of potentially uh, deploying arms uh, to Russia. And so this all really created a bit of concern about really where this relationship stands uh, between the two blocs. 
Yeah, so Russia and China really the elephant in the room here. Excellent reporting from yeah. Bloomberg. How are we hearing that both sides are responding to that reporting? Well, I think it's been interesting uh, to see the response, really, and just how swift uh, we saw from both sides responding to this Bloomberg reporting. So we heard, uh, let's just start with the EU. We heard the EU ambassador uh, to South Africa coming out. Her name is Sandra Kramer. She tweeted uh, on X uh, and she posted uh, saying that this is false and misleading. S uh, South Africa and the U.S. are working closely towards holding a, a summit. Uh, and we're also hearing from South Africa saying that it still insists that this relationship relationship uh, between the West, between the EU and the U.S. is still very important. And they point uh, to the fact that President Cyril Ramaphosa and also uh, Foreign Minister Nalendi Pandor have held uh, regular meetings uh, with the West. Uh, and so uh, it seems like there is uh, in some part, uh, you know, there's some effort to have this summit be held. But we have to remember that we're just a few weeks uh, out uh, from an election being held here in South Africa. And so the question is, what happens after that election, how does that uh, affect potentially the relationship? And really, what does this mean for the future relationship between South Africa and the Western powers and Russia and China? So uh, a really complicated story here, but a, a lot of a lot of sides weighing in, Lizzie. Yeah, can it be the reset button on that relationship? Maybe not in a yeah. good way. Bloomberg's Jennifer Sabasaja, we thank you for bringing us the latest. Now, for some other stories making news this morning, British Foreign Secretary David Cameron has held a meeting with Donald Trump in an effort to persuade the presidential candidate's Republican allies to stop blocking more aid for Ukraine. The talks in Florida came ahead of Cameron's trip to Washington to meet lawmakers as well as Biden administration officials there. A $60 billion U.S. aid package for Ukraine has, of course, become snarled on politicking ahead of the November presidential election. Elsewhere in UK news, a new survey of British adults says about 7.5 million people are struggling to pay their bills, with many falling behind on their domestic or credit commitments. The estimate from the Financial Conduct Authority shows a big drop in the numbers in difficulty, down from 11 million at the start of last year. But the total is still higher than before the cost of living spiralled after the pandemic. And we'll bring you more on both of those conversations on the uh, Bloomberg UK Politics podcast out today. And we also have a conversation with the US ambassador to China coming up next on the programme. He tells us Washington is seeking to isolate China with the help of its allies in Asia. We'll have more on that next. This is Bloomberg. I think Chair Powell has made it very clear that he's willing to look through these bumps. To use his phrase, the inflation story hasn't changed. So they will need overwhelming evidence that it is more than a bump in order for them to change their views. You think they're too sensitive to recent data and maybe not being strategic enough. What do you mean by that? So I think if you look forward, and, and you talked about in the last hour about business confidence, if you look forward, there's reasons to believe that this economy may slow. So if you are setting policy not according to what has happened, but according to the lags with which the policy operate, you would be more dovish than you would be otherwise. If, however, you focus exclusively on the data, you will end up being too hawkish. You talk about small business uh, optimism. Let's go there. It came in at the lowest level since December of 2012. Sometimes it's hard to know how to read some of these gauges, especially because we get people on all the time saying they're all broken. How important is this in contrast with all of the bullishness and the momo and the fomo and the wo wo that we keep hearing? This is really important. The big mistake that was made in 2021 when people embrace the transitory narrative was they didn't listen to the companies. And the companies were clearly saying we have inflationary pressures in the pipeline, we have pricing power, we're going to pass on that imported inflation, if you like, that was coming in. This time around, listen to the earnings call and they are worried about the outlook for the rest of the year. So, so I do think you need to listen to them because often the aggregate data doesn't capture what businesses are feeling on the ground. 
Listen to companies, he says, if you don't want to make the mistakes again of the past. That's our Bloomberg Opinion columnist, Mohamed Elarian there. Now to another interview. The U.S. ambassador to Japan has told Bloomberg that Washington is seeking to isolate China with the help of Tokyo and other regional allies. Rahm Emanuel spoke to Bloomberg from the White House lawn ahead of a visit by Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. This comes at a historic moment for both countries as they change dramatically their kind of deterrence uh, posture and position. Japan's changed in the last two years five separate policies that have been basically on the books for 70 years from the size of the defense budget, the counter-strike capability in the defense area, normalizing and level, really bringing the level of relationship with the ROK, the Republic of Korea, to a new, more solid strategic level. The United States also has made some fundamental changes going from a hub and spoke system to a lattice uh, multinational type of strategic architecture. And I kind of see this state visit, the fourth from a uh, head of state in the region out of five that the president's done, is kind of putting a period at the end of one era that's defined as alliance protection and beginning to write the first chapter of the new era of alliance projection with uh, Japan. And that's not just for the Indo-Pacific, but also as a key strategic partner in a global set of issues. The second thing, it's kind of uh, bookend. The week started with Australia, the United States, Japan, and the Philippines doing naval and uh, air exercises together in a new multinational uh, effort. And have the ends of uh, the week with a historic first ever trilateral between the United States, Japan, and the Philippines head of state. That reflects and symbolizes the change in the United States approach. It also symbolizes the uh, kind of role that Japan's going to play as a constant in our, air, in our relationships in the area. But it also symbolizes China's whole strategy is to isolate the Philippines, isolate Australia with their economic coercion, isolate Japan by not accepting uh, their fish to be exported. Our strategy is to flip that script and make the isolated party China. They're the ones that are uh, isolated in the South China Sea as it relates to the Philippines. They're the ones that are isolated when it comes to trying to uh, use economic coercion to coerce Australia to change their posture. And they become the isolated party, which is why they throw in the towel on that effort. So that's how this uh, state visit, it's been a long, it's been uh, nine years since the last Japanese prime, uh, prime minister has had a visit, but it comes at a critical juncture where the relationship will pivot into a new kind of posture and a new position. I wanted to hone in, Ambassador, you've mentioned, of course, the first trilat summit with the Philippines. How far do you expect Japan to involve itself when it comes to these confrontations in the South China Sea, where, of course, these encounters tend to be more aggressive than what we see in the East China Sea? Well, the whole goal is not to have a conflict. That's what credible deterrence is. And understanding that this is not China versus the Philippines. This is China trying to uh, coerce the Philippines into changing their policy, on which the international court in 2016 ruled was in favor of the Philippines, not China. And understanding that China needs to understand that the Philippines has some very, very important friends in the neighborhood, the United States, Japan, and Australia in this situation. U.S. Ambassador to Japan, Rahm Emanuel, speaking to Bloomberg earlier ahead of the Japanese Prime Minister's visit to Washington. Coming up on the program, a Boeing employee says the plane maker took shortcuts to ease production bottlenecks for its 787 Dreamliner. We'll bring you that story next. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. This has been Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Lizzie Burden in London, and these are the stories that set your agenda. Shares in Hong Kong rally while Treasury yields come off their 2024 highs as traders count down to the latest reading on U.S. inflation. The Fed's Raphael Bostic says he's open to changing his view for only one rate cut this year if the economic data justify it. 
Plus, Boeing shares extend their slide as a whistleblower makes new allegations of shortcuts in the production of the 787 Dreamliner. Well, good morning. It is caution, the watchword on the markets this morning as we wait for that U.S. inflation report later. It's kind of been a thorn in the side of traders who are impatient for rate cuts so far this year. You've had two hot CPI prints so far. Could this be another one? Yesterday on the markets, you saw the S&P dipping below that 5,200 level, NVIDIA leading the losses and closing just slightly higher than that level. But this morning, futures pointing to a slightly higher opening both stateside and much more strongly here in Europe. But if we flip the board over to the cross asset picture, not a whole lot of movement expected on treasuries in the run up to that inflation report. You've got the 10 year yield currently at 4.35 percent, having climbed in yesterday's session treasuries. The 10 year yield is, as you can see, below that 4.5% level that we were talking about earlier in the week. But the dollar, pretty steady now, crude below $90 a barrel as traders weigh, on the one hand, the geopolitical tensions, and on the other, this new report uh, pointed to a gain in U.S. crude stockpiles. And then finally, you've got gold there at 2358 an ounce, so hovering below that record high of 2384. All lies, as I say, on that inflation report. But we've just had some breaking news across the terminal. It is the latest sales numbers from TSMC, the world's top chip maker. And they have come in uh, at... Uh, $195.2 billion. Uh, so this is up 3, 34% year on year. So impressive numbers here, and we will dig into them later in the programme uh, with Tim Culpin. Of course, we also had the news yesterday that TSMC is getting $11.6 billion of grants and loans from the US government in order to build factories in Arizona. Uh, so we had the uh, shares benefiting from that yesterday. We will break down those numbers uh, from Tim Culpin in Taipei. Uh, but 195 uh, billion Taiwanese dollars is the number for March sales from TSMC. But now let's check in on how Asia markets are faring. We have Tanya Chen in Hong Kong on standby for us. Tanya. Hey, good morning, Lizzie. Yeah, lots of breaking news out of our region today. Just recapping something that happened just an hour, about an hour ago. China's outlook being downgraded by Fitch ratings. Um, they're citing long-term foreign debt problems. They're citing concerns about its uh, fiscal buffer buffers. Um, if you look there, though, the rating um, actually is still being affirmed at A+. Um, there's still, obviously, a lot of um, economic growth that they are um, looking and monitoring, and there's also strength in trade as well. China's ministry also responded saying that they were disappointed uh, about the Fitch's outlook revision, that um, it will continue to resolve its local government debt problems, and the scale of that hidden debt has been gradually reduced. Um, if you look over at how Chinese assets have uh, reacted to this breaking news, equities um, prior to the lunch break had already been outperforming. and seems that they're extending those gains, particularly around technology shares. Uh, both the Chinese government bond yields and the uh, yuan are, uh, were remain steady around the breaking news. Um, we did see in December that Moody's had also done a similar downgrade to their outlook. And so perhaps this uh, sentiment has largely been priced into the market already. Um, elsewhere in the rest of the region, as you have been saying, kind of the rest of the market is waiting for this U.S. CPI numbers, especially for currency traders, especially everyone's looking at where the yen is right now. It's just still right below that 34-year th uh, low against that dollar. Um, Traders are watching out for potential signs of intervention. Bloomberg had a report out saying that the central bankers may consider raising its inflation forecast later this month. Um, Governor Ueda has reaffirmed, though, that the um, tightening policy may not have been one and done um, in March. Also, elsewhere, the Kiwi is strengthening a little bit. The central bank earlier today held, uh, had a hawkish hold, saying that they were looking for a more sustained period of restrictive rates. We'll also get a decision out of the Bank of Thailand later today as well. Well. All right, no surprises from the RBNZ. Tanya Chen in Hong Kong, thanks for taking us through those Asia markets. Now, back to Boeing. The Federal Aviation Authority is investing claims made by a Boeing employee who says the plane maker took shortcuts to ease production bottlenecks for its 787 Dreamliner. In a statement, Boeing said the claims were, quote, inaccurate and don't represent the comprehensive work being done to ensure the quality and long-term safety of the aircraft. Well, to take us through what 
what's been going on here. We have Bloomberg's Benedict Camel. Benny, great to have you on the programme. Just tell us more about what this whistleblower is actually alleging. So this allegation came out last night. Uh, the whistleblower appeared uh, on a conference call uh, together with his lawyers. And the allegation, as you said, is around the 787 Dreamliner. That's the larger model, uh, the, the wide-body aircraft. And the allegation is essentially that the way the plane was put together, so you have these barrels that are pieced together that then show cracks and they have to fix them in the production process, that that wasn't done properly um, that they applied shortcuts, that they put speed over sort of caution, that they were too fast putting these together. Obviously, as you say, Boeing disputes this, says that's not true. We have uh, robust processes in place. But the allegation is out there. Um, and as you said, the stock did take a bit of a dip um, as a result. And Boeing deliveries also came in alongside the Airbus delivery numbers. They were the lowest in Q1 for almost three years, but you did have a bit of a glimmer of hope visible in March on perhaps the order side. You're right. And to be honest, you know, the first quarter was one to forget, and everyone really knows that. People knew that this was a very difficult f phase for Boeing. Um, and the numbers came in a little bit light, but they weren't terrible. Um, and so there is some hope looking forward. They've managed to stabilize the output. Uh, they have one order, so it shows that there is still a product that people want to buy. If they can maintain this and sort of start crawling out towards the end of the year, then maybe there's a hope for a recovery at Boeing. Right. Yeah. Not so bad. But how does it compare to Airbus? So obviously side by side it looks much worse. Airbus had a fairly strong quarter. The, the first quarter is always a little bit weaker. They're coming out of the, the rush of the, the end of the year and then the first couple of months are always a little bit on the light side. But as you said, side by side, Airbus obviously looks much stronger. And that's sort of the bigger story here, that we have these two companies taking these diverging paths. Airbus doing very well. Boeing really working through a whole series of problems. I'm getting on a plane to Frankfurt later. You'll have to tell me afterwards which kind of plane I'll be getting on Bloomberg's Benedict Cavill. We thank you for that update on the Boeing allegations and the latest numbers. Now, a Bloomberg source says at least three people have been killed after an explosion at a hydropower plant in northern Italy. Enel's renewables arm, Enel Green Power, says fire impacted a transformer at the plant. And we can get more details now with Bloomberg's Alberto Brambilla, who joins us now. Alberto, what happened here and what's the current situation on the ground? Yesterday afternoon, an incident occurred in uh, Enel Green Power plant in the northern Italy. And uh, uh, it's near a, a dam, a water basin. Uh, the, the workers were doing a maintenance, a maintenance round, uh, were um, up, up leveling uh, the facility when the, a turbine exploded and actually uh, damaged a water pipe and uh, that flooded the building. And they were working four, uh, four, uh, 40, 40 meters deep underground. And um, the, the search for the survivors actually went uh, along all the night by the firefighters. Uh, it, it's uh, five, it's uh, uh, four, uh, four people are missing, while three are dead, and uh, five are seriously, seriously injured. And um, today, the, the, today the, the authority will, uh, will start the investigating on, on the case. So Alberto, of course the focus is on the human toll, but can you just walk us through how much disruption it's caused in terms of the power supply, the other potential impact? Yeah, the potential impact for now is, um, the, the company said that the, the impact, for now there is no, no impact on the production of ele electricity production, neither nationally, neither locally, even though the, the facility is actually one of the most powerful of the region in the northern Italy, Emilia Romagna. And uh, actually the, uh, the investigations are ongoing by the authorities and by the judiciary, and so they will take time before the, the plant will, uh, will restart properly. And so the, this is remain to be seen what will be actually the impact on the on the network and on the power production. Okay. Bloomberg's Alberto Brambia, we thank you for that update on that deadly explosion yesterday. Well coming up, Europe's defence stocks slide after Goldman Sachs warns of peak multiples in defence firms shares. We'll bring you that next. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. If you're just joining us, it's 6.42 a.m. here in London. And we saw European defence stocks falling heavily yesterday for their worst day in almost 18 months. This is after Goldman Sachs analysts warned that the sector's recent rally had left it trading at elevated price valuations. For more, I'm joined now by Bloomberg's Oliver Crook in Berlin. Oli, a big sell-off in defence. Just take us through these moves. Yeah, so we saw, it, as you say, you know, the biggest sell-off in defense stocks in almost a year and a half and names that have really only moved in one direction for the last two years since the invasion of Ukraine. So that's Saab, Leonardo, uh, Ryan Mittal, all basically in the red. And actually, they were the biggest losers on the stock 600 yesterday. A lot of this was traced back to that Goldman note that you're mentioning that really they're flagging these issues on multiples that are a little bit higher. What they were pointing to is price to earnings that are about a 45% premium to, his, uh, to the SOX 600 um, versus historically when it's usually at a 7% discount, right? And so when, also when thinking about these stocks, so it's important to put it all into sort of context. Yes, it's a big sell-off, you know, almost 10% off of Saab yesterday. We've got to put this into context, right? And so we have to pick our superlatives pretty carefully here because there are so many of them. But since the invasion of Ukraine, you know, Ryan Metal is up almost 400 Uh, and 50%. It is the third best um, performer on the MSCI World Index, and it carries the same P.E. ratio, actually just above Apple. And these are all things that would have thought completely unthinkable a couple years ago, but that's really what happens when you have these black swan events and really it's such a paradigm shift as you do in European defense and how Europe is thinking about its own defense and spending money on it. Yeah, we were just talking about the UK Foreign Secretary David Cameron going over to the US trying to lobby Donald Trump to keep that aid going to Ukraine if he becomes the president. So you would think that there's going to be funding to keep the war going and fund spending on defence. But what, Ollie, does the path look like ahead for these companies? Yeah, so Lizzie, for investors, I think it's really trying to weigh up those two sides, the structural tailwinds and the possible headwinds. So the structural tailwinds are some of the things that you're talking about there, right? Europe needs to get to its 2% spend on NATO. There is the question of if Trump was uh, elected president of the United States, what does it mean? Would the U.S. pull back? And would that mean even more spending on defense, maybe closer to 4%? That's what it was during the Cold War. And we had a story out yesterday from Bloomberg Economics that crunched the numbers. If the G7 were to try to go to 4% of, of GDP spend on defense, Defense, that would mean $10 trillion over the next 10 years. So that would be absolutely mammoth. And we're also still at the very beginning of the European rearming strategy, a rearming strategy that involves spending that money not just on defense, but on European defense, which is why these stocks have done so well. So what the market is trying to do and investors are trying to say is, yes, we have all these tailwinds, but how durable are there and what are the threats? The threats are... Um, you know, what, where is this money going to come from, right? You can only have money come in so many ways. You have to raise taxes. You have to either raise debt. You need to cut spending elsewhere, or you need to grow. You know, growth is not necessarily the strong suit um, for Europe uh, historically, and you're not really going to get there uh, where you need to get on defense. Taxes is raising taxes. That's not terribly popular. And getting cuts to the other parts of the, of the government, very complicated, as we learned with the German budget crisis. And debt, there isn't that much fiscal headroom for a number of the countries within Europe. So all of these things, are the questions that investors are weighing right now. But I think it's fair to say when you have something so big, a paradigm shift, yes, investors taking a little bit of money off of the table, but I don't think we're probably um, quite at the final pricing on this, Lizzie. Okay, really interesting to look at the market, the company impact of that geopolitical news out of NATO and out of the various diplomatic wranglings going on around the world. Blue Mugs, Oliver Crook, we thank you for that update on European defence stocks. Now, we've got a lot to watch out for here today. At 12 p.m. London time, it's U.S. MBA mortgage applications. At 1.30 p.m. London time, of course, it's U.S. CPI, the highlight of the economic data for the week. And then at 6 p.m., we get the U.S. 10-year note auction. It's worth about $39 billion. Before at 7 p.m. London time, it's those Fed meeting minutes uh, with the U.S. monthly budget statement. So we keep an eye on that for clues as to the rate path ahead. We've got plenty more coming up. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg.
Let's get back now to those latest numbers from the chipmaker TSMC that we broke earlier in the program. Sales for the month of March increased 34% compared to a year ago, coming in at more than 6.1 billion US dollars. Tim Culpin from Bloomberg Opinion joins me now for analysis. Tim, just break down these numbers for us, would you? Well, it's a big number, $6 billion just for the month. But for the whole quarter, more than $18.8 .8 billion. Uh, now, that's actually slightly ahead of their own guidance. They guided 18 to 18.8. .8. So uh, a little bit ahead, which is very, very nice. It augurs well for a good year for TSMC. Uh, you know, the chip industry has been very, very strong over the last year. But in fact, TSMC sales fell last year, mainly because things like iPhones and other mobile phones were not doing well. AI has been the area that's really picked up for them. NVIDIA, of course, is a huge client for them. AMD is another big client. Ironically, Intel is a competitor, but also a client. Intel actually outsources some of their best chips to TSMC for manufacturing. So there's a lot uh, of chip demand in what we call high-performance computing. That's the, you know, the massive server farms that are built and uh, operating to build AI models for all of these companies around the world who are very excited about that. And that's really going to be the driver for this year. And the first quarter looks like a really, really good start for TSMC. Because of course we also saw Intel unveiling its new AI accelerator to try and challenge NVIDIA. What's the sort of ripple effect for TSMC? That's really good news for TSMC, whichever way you look at it, because some of those chips will probably end up going to TSMC to be manufactured. And if they're not, then AMD and NVIDIA will just have to double down and go back to TSMC with the latest designs and really prompt TSMC to churn them out for them as well. So this kind of AI arms race, while TSMC is building the, the weapons for the AI arms race, everybody's going to need to turn to them at some point. So yes, Intel comes out with a new chip. Fantastic. I think TSMC would welcome that. And then your good news doesn't stop for TSMC. Of course, yesterday we also saw them winning a load of grants and loans from the U.S. government. How significant is that for TSMC, but also for the broader chip making industry? Well, TSMC is not going to say no to $6.6 .6 billion in grants. There's another $5 billion, which is really just a sweetener. Uh, it's a loan that the, the U.S. government is going to offer, but it's a loan, so they're going to have to pay it back. So it really doesn't count as the grant. The $6.6 .6 billion compared to the $65 billion TSMC is expecting to spend in Arizona over the next few years sounds like a lot of money. It's really a drop in the bucket. And the thing is, they don't automatically get that number. They've got to keep hitting various phases of uh, contracts with the U.S. Department of Commerce and Treasury to say, hey, you know, you've got to churn out this many chips at this time schedule. If they miss any of that, they won't get all of the money. So it's dependent on them hitting a lot of targets over the next few years. If they do execute, they could get up to $6.6 .6 billion. But again, uh, that is not a lot compared to the massive, massive expenditure they're putting in to Arizona. And it is going to be good for the rest of the industry. Intel is also, you know, expanding in the U.S. Samsung, the other big chip maker, is also expanding in the U.S. So overall, it's very, very good uh, for the U.S. chip ecosystem. But we need to see how it's going to play out over the next few years because engineers are much more expensive than you get in Korea or in Taiwan. So the cost of making the chips will be a lot higher. And clients like Apple, NVIDIA, AMD are going to have to wear that cost. $6 billion chicken feed, or it is if you're TSMC. Tim Culpin from Bloomberg Opinion, we thank you for breaking down those latest numbers. Now, Mazda's CEO says the car makers watching global supply chain issues caused in part by battery shortages and increasing exports from China. The CEO told us those challenges have only grown after last month's Baltimore bridge collapse. At the moment, uh, our operation team has been closely working with the port of Baltimore and a concerned entity to find out uh, port points uh, nearby for in inbound vessels. And also we are working for you know, alternative uh, ports uh, we have in the East Coast, Jacksonville, temporarily to minimize the uh, delay of delivery to the customer. So that is the current outlook, and uh, we're looking forward to come back to uh, Port of Baltimore once the operation is back on track. So that's dealing with the finished product, the delivery of those products. As far as making your cars here, are you dealing with any supply chain constraints, the getting supplies and things? Uh, we do have a supply chain issue uh, uh, globally. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a few reasons behind it. Uh, one is the uh, vessel shortages. Um, during pandemic, vessel companies scrapped the old vessels and they are reinvented to more 
uh, LNG based, uh, you know, uh, better fuel efficiency and low CO2 vessels. That is one reason. The second reason is uh, just uh, mentioned Suez Canal and, and the Panama Canal are, uh, is uh, unable to pass through. And the third reason is the significant increase in the export from China mainland. Mm -hmm. Those are contributing to a significant challenge for you know, logistics right now. I, I am curious. I'm glad you brought up China. Most of what they're exporting, though, are they, those are primarily EVs, or, or are they direct competitors to the models that Mazda is producing? It is a combination between battery, pure battery EV mm -hmm. and the range extender and the internal combustion engine. Mm -hmm. It depends on the brand of, or Chinese brand. Mm -hmm. What car do you think will sell the most, EVs, hybrids, or ICEs in the next, say, five years? Uh, I believe still internal combustion engine has really? strong support from the consumers. Mm. Uh, and secondly, I see a great potential in hybrid. Mm -hmm. That is a perfect solution uh, uh, for customers. Uh, there is no uh, anxiety for range. Uh, right now, it's getting uh, traction right now. An exclusive conversation with the Mazda CEO right there. But, of course, the focus today is the U.S. inflation report. 1.30 p.m. London time is when it drops. And it has been a bumpy path of disinflation so far for the U.S. economy. Just take a look at this chart. You can just see how sticky super core inflation has been in the U.S. If you strip out food and energy, you can see it right here. But if you flip the board, we can take a look at the potential market reaction because nervous traders really have have been pretty nervous in the run-up to economic data of late. You can see it in the difference between the one-day VIX and the VIX. You've got the uh, jobs numbers in the blue bars, white bars showing the CPI. So brace yourselves. The drama hasn't ended yet, and they'll take you through it all on the next programme. Markets Today is coming up next, so stay with us. This is Bloomberg.